It's all yours. Excellent. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for coming by, folks. Um, I hope I'm as, half as interesting as lunch was. Um, I've been uh, doing uh, API talks are very relevant in the industry, and I've been doing these. Um, but I find they're much more interesting when, when somebody has a beer in their hand. So I really encourage these to happen at, a, at like a, a, a brew pub or something like that. So hopefully I, um, I've got you early enough today. Um, you haven't digested your food enough that you're going to fall asleep. But uh, We'll, uh, we'll, we will endeavor to make it interesting and exciting. Um, so as my um, very embarrassing, I hate the bio. Like, I don't know if anybody do these talks, but someone always emails me for my bio, and I'm like, mm, that, I, I hate those descriptions. Um, they they're, make me very self-conscious. Um, but my background is just that. Um, I, uh, I consider myself a, a, a programmer. Um, I'm a horrible programmer. Um, I, I just stumble through and, uh, you know, half the time use ChatGPT or uh, Stack Exchange or somebody else's code to, to make I do what I want it to make happen. Um, I recently uh, released some code um, to the company, to F5 uh, internally, and I had to share my, my private Git repo um, if, has anybody anybody written their own code and like had this baby that you've been working on for like six months or a year and they have to show it to people? Um, yes, yeah, I, sorry, that is the scariest thing you could possibly do. Um, I can stand in front of a thousand people and present and that's fine, uh, but to actually have someone look at my code and go, wow, I thought you were a good programmer, um, is, uh, you know, it kind of rips my heart out. Um, but uh, so, that's kind of the problem the world faces. Um, the keynote this morning, um, Alicia, I think, was, uh, Alyssa was her name. Um, I thought it was phenomenal. Uh, she had a great talk um, and uh, very captivating. But what she said was right, where she hacked those, uh, those APIs um, and hacked it once and got 300 for free um, happens all too often. Um, I just described what I did. Right? I use ChatGPT to write a bunch of stuff. I use Stack Exchange to write a bunch of stuff. Um, because you know why? I, I have a self-image problem. Um, and you know, I, I think everybody is better and smarter than I am and probably does a whole bunch of threat modeling and fixing stuff um, before they release it to the world. Right? Well, there's chuckles because it's not right, right? Um, the, the, the world has been built on, uh, you know, three lines of Hello World that was probably written in 1954 in COBOL um, and just been ported and ported and ported and advanced since then. Um, and all the problems that we've had um, continue to, to, to keep moving forward. Um, and so I start this presentation with this slide. Um, and I will say I've been using PowerPoint since 19... 91 or 92, I think is the first time I did a PowerPoint presentation. It was on three floppy disks. Um, and I have no idea how to make this slide automatically restart. It's magic to me. I don't know how. So I constantly re replay this. So you see me every once in a while, I just come up here and click it so it replays. But this is a very interesting slide. Um, and it shows the timeline of the world uh, for the last little while um, and how APIs are becoming a problem and have been a problem. Um, and I, 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 so I'm going to start the story with a little bit about myself. Um, in, in 2000 and, uh, the mid-2000s, so 2008, 2009, um, I was working for a startup. Um, that means, I, you know, the company went out of business. That's what startup means, right? Um, so I found myself um, as an independent contractor. My wife politely calls it self-unemployed. Um, and so I was hunting and hunting for some work to do, and... Um, a friend of mine put me onto a, a, a project that was looked like a lot of fun, and um, in in the, in the hopes of doing something interesting and fun, um, you know, I, I took the meeting and I met with the people, and um, they had this idea of a of, of a game. So this is two thousand and uh, two thousand and nine, um, a game, a mobile game that you're going to play in a movie theater, um, sort of before the movies play, the movie starts. So um, it's called the the pre show. Um, and so they were developing this to sort of get you, in, you know, go to go to go to your movie, and you'd play this, and you get some coupons and all kinds of stuff. So I still haven't let, written a lick of, of one line of mobile code in my life. I've written tons and tons of applications, lots and lots of 
you know, dozens of lines of code probably are attributed to me, not just what I've stolen from other people. Um, but I've never written anything uh, as a mobile application. But we were developing it for the three fantastic application uh, technologies at the time, uh, which were in 2009, which was number one? BlackBerry. Yes, yeah, so great. Right? Hold our heads high as Canadians, right? Um, and uh, we, we needed it for uh, BlackBerry, Android, and this upstart from Apple. This was, taking, was starting to, to, to move into the market. Um, and so we needed a, an interface to have people engage with it, right? So I had been writing some Facebook applications at the time, um, some integration with uh, some, some consumer-based uh, marketing and stuff. And uh, so they wanted to tie in Facebook, and they wanted to be able to create your account and share this kind of stuff. And then you get a coupon that you can go to the kiosk, you know, to the confectionery, and you know, get a get a free chocolate bar or whatever it's going to be. And so they had to build this, and then they had to build a mobile application. Well, I said I don't I don't write mobile applications. I said no, 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 it's okay. We've got a company in Ottawa that's going to write the code, um, completely fine. I said oh, good, but we need somebody to put the whole thing together. We need somebody to to architect it, and we want it done with uh, a RESTful APIs. And I said. What did I say? Yes. I said, fantastic. I know all about RESTful APIs. Why? Because I could Google it when I got out of the meeting. Because it was 2009. I, didn't have a, I couldn't Google it on my phone at the time, right? So, um, so I looked up what, the, what, what a RESTful API was. And we ended up writing this application um, so that you could have a mobile application. But, but we also built a, you know, a web front end so you could sign up and all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little story, um, or a, a little hint. Um, uh, the first thing I'm going to tell you about d developers and hackers um, is we're lazy. We we don't want to do anything more than once. Um, we want to make we want to do it as often as, as as little as possible and make it as ubiquitous as possible, right? So, um, so they said with this RESTful API, we should be able to create the applications and do all these things in in you know without having to. Write one for the website, one for a mobile application. It's pretty advanced, right? Today, this is just like no brainer, right? I mean, you're like, okay, I'm going to consume this in 14 different things. Um, so that was 2009, 2010. Uh, I joined two, uh, F5 in 2011, um, and that's when this this graph this this slide starts. It's not a coincidence that I ran screaming from the application development market um, at that time, but I'm very happy I did um, because. Over time, APIs have become a real challenge for protecting, um, or protecting from people, right? From from bad from bad actors, um, and this isn't something that's unique to just me, right? Um, I will say I really hope no one hacked into my environment and and, and broke into it um, and and stole custom, customer data, but I really don't know, right? It's very hard to tell. Um, there's, but that doesn't just relate to just, you know, me being a, a self-unemployed developer, you know, working in my basement. Um, it relates to a whole bunch of organizations out there today too. Um, so if I, if I ask you one question, how do you know someone's a Peloton user? Yes, we will. <laughs> It's the same as being a pilot and a, and a CrossFitter, and I don't do CrossFit, right? Um, somehow we'll get into the conversation, right? We will tell you. What's even easier than that? Then you don't need to talk to a Peloton person, right? Use the API, exactly. So you can just ask their API. So um, back in 2020, um, if anybody remembers 2020, um, without shaking and crying, <laughs> Peloton, um, you know, certainly enjoyed uh, a, a boon at the time um, and really took off in the, in, in the world. They were less than a million users. Um, the mobile app was kind of, you know, some people use the mobile app. They had a, they had a device, you know, they had, a, they had, a, they had a, uh, a tread at the time, they had a bike at the time. Um, and then everybody got locked into their houses and everybody wanted to, you know, use and work out and do all these crazy things. And Peloton took off. So they were flush with cash. If like me, um, you thought that their stock could never go down and you bought them at $100, <clears throat> okay, you can take a lot of security tips from me. Do not take a stock tip from me, okay? It's one thing I will warn you I am not good at. Um, and so they, they really needed to figure out what they were going to do. 
Um, and so they invested heavily in new IT. Um, they had a lot of stuff on the go. They were building like crazy. They went from less than a million people to well over 5 million, maybe, maybe 8 or 10 million people accessing their environment. That's a scale that's impossible to fathom. Think about your busiest application that you have now, and somebody's going to say it's going to increase five times in a month. How do you handle that without sweaty palms and screaming and crying? Right? I, I had that. I had that. I was, I was number one on CrackBerry for one of my applications. Worst day of my life. I got hacked like you would not believe. I had people all over my SQL server. I had all, people banging into my environment. We went from about 1,000 downloads a day to when we went to number one in Crack Bay, we were, we were 10,000 downloads a minute. How do, you, like, how do you scale that? We couldn't. We had, our, we had a single pipe. We, spinning stuff up in rack space. Didn't even know what rack space was at the time. Like, this is crazy, right? This is what these guys went through. So they were trying to figure out, they're, they're literally building the plane in the air, like that old video from, I don't know, the, the consulting company where they're literally building the plane in the air. This is what these guys are doing. It's a tough job. But they try to make the right decisions. They try to use a good technology. So they use something called GraphQL. So GraphQL is a, uh, is a way of providing data without having to do an API level. You can, it, it's much more optimized for mobile devices. Uh, it's, it's a much more streamlined uh, uh, communications me mechanism. So GraphQL is a great way to share data. It doesn't, doesn't stop you using REST, because REST, you still need to use that to talk back in the application. But sharing the data and getting the data was very different. And so this is what they did. They turned this stuff on. And they put a bunch of protections in place. They protected that whole network. They were worried about everything on the edge, and they figured out everything they could possibly do. Fantastic, right? Fantastic story. Ends there. Does it end there? No, it doesn't end there. The problem was, um, the way APIs are built, sometimes your business logic's exposed. So they used a bunch of Kubernetes pods. Anybody here play with Kubernetes? Right? Yeah. I could, I could stumble my way through a container. Um, and when they put it together, they exposed a bunch of stuff that they didn't expect that they were exposing. So as a Peloton user, I like to tell people I'm a Peloton user. I think it's a fantastic platform. That's why I tell people about it. But I don't want you to know what bike I had when the last time I worked out. That's, uh, that's only something I share with certain people. I don't want you to know my home address. All that kind of information. So you remember the BOLA stuff that uh, Alicia was talking about this morning? This is this to the nth degree. You can get everything. The whole, the whole network, the whole data, everything is available inside of here. Right? You can go in here and make a query. You could, the beauty of, of developing something with, Gra with GraphQL is just something called introspection, and it'll tell you how to talk to it. It'll say, here are the functions that you can do to pull data out or push data in. Right? But you're not supposed to have that on in your environment so everybody can see it. And they didn't on the edge. But unfortunately, when you made a call to inter internal environments, you saw how those environments were, 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 were put together. And lo and behold, you're able to pull that data out. And this is the kind of information that they were exposed. So is this a breach? Anybody call this a breach? No? It's a misuse of information? Right? Data leakage, maybe, right? Breach is iffy. No, it's a breach. Call it a breach because it, companies out there are trying to say, no, this isn't a breach. I don't need to report it. It's a breach, right? It's a breach of confidence. It's a breach of, of, of the, 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 the confidence that you've put in those organizations, right? Don't, don't give them any leeway. Make sure they're protecting it, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I can look what my next slide is. All right, I have another question for you. Or maybe this is an axiom, maybe not a question. Um, hackers lie. Right? I'm not a hacker. I hack code. I've hacked websites. Okay, I don't lie that often, all right? Um, so there's something called uh, bug... Um, um, <laughs> 
I tried to think of Hacker One. There, I was going to say Bug Crowd, but I knew it wasn't Bug Crowd. Uh, Hacker One. Um, so, anybody know what Hacker One is? Right. So, Hacker One. Um, if you're bored on a Sunday uh, or on a Saturday and you want to make some extra money, uh, you can go to Hacker One and you can go hack somebody's website completely legally. Right. If you are somebody who owns a website or manages a website, check out Hacker One or Bug Crowd or any one of these services because they're phenomenal. It's a way for you to have something called responsible disclosure and you define how people are allowed to hack you. Don't touch this, you're allowed to poke in here. You're allowed to pull this data out over here, you're allowed to do this, but you're not allowed to do that, right? They're very def well-defined characteristics of how these things work. But the thing I like about this, this Hacker One report, so this is 2020, um, in 2021 and 2022 they released it too, but Honestly, it's not a fancy little graph that it was easy for me to put together, so I just leave this slide in here for a few years. But this is me telling you hackers lie. Because hackers say they spend 71% of their time on uh, hacking websites. What did Alyssa say this morning? I chuckled when she said this, said this line. When she was talking about, it, about how she attacks, right? She watches the website, she goes and uses the website, she, she starts figuring out what's going on, and then she, then she throws the website away. Because the website has all the stupid business logic that they want us to adhere to. Right? The fun part is when you start playing with that business logic. Why? Because developers are lazy. But in a good way. We want the systems to be used, right? So to me, when I see 71% of the time people spend on websites and 7% of the time they spend on APIs, that is not me. I might spend 7% of my time looking at your website. And I'm going to show you a couple things later, if we've got some time, about how easy it is to pull all that stuff together using something like Postman and Chrome. Right? Reduce that from 7% down to 3%. And grab all, those, all that traffic that's going on between your mobile application, your web application, and the back-end servers. Right? All that stuff is happening. And there's fun things you can do when you start poking at it. And that's what hackers do. That's typically where we start to find those, those vulnerabilities. When I was developing that, that, uh, that, that pre-show application, I had a, a team that I, you know, I, I brought in to, to help me with it. And um, my QA director, one of my best friends, let's, let's be honest, um, you know, we, there was a... I had about eight or eight or ten people at some point working in my in my basement, and so Paul would show up in the morning, and we'd share share an office, and we would write the contract of how the applications were going to work, right? So so we defined that here's a create user API, here's a create address API, and we would document it. Another axiom about developers: we are not good documenters. <laughs> If I can get somebody to take the things that are mulling around and bouncing around in my brain and get somebody else to write it, fantastic. ChatGPT, I wish I could, I could just have a brain dump. It would be phenomenal. Uh, but Paul and I spent many, 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 many hours, weeks, months, really, defining this stuff before we wrote one, li one line of code. Because in order for me to go and create a user and for that to appear on somebody's iPhone, I didn't have an iPhone in 2009. You know, I wasn't a multimillionaire or anything like that, right? To be able to see that, that had to be, that had to happen, right, in a way that we had, a, we had established a contract. So that contract was a bunch of pieces of paper that I wrote, PDFs, PDFs, and PDFs. And so when we wrote them, it was great. And then I would sit and code. And when, is a, when does every developer code? Three o'clock in the morning, right? Um, when life gets in the way and all the other things you got going on, you, you, you code at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then Paul would show up at 8 o'clock in the morning the next, the next morning, and I said, ah, oh, I got that create user API ready to go. And the, uh, you know, the create address is, is good to go for you to test, too. And he would look at me and go, hmm. And then before he has a sip of his coffee or tea, don't drink coffee, he'd say, I broke it. And I'd say, what do you mean you broke it? We spent like three weeks writing the, writing the spec. How can you break it? He goes, well, I threw an asterisk in the, in, in the phone number. I said, well, why would you throw an asterisk in the phone number? Because I knew you didn't expect it, right? Because we're so in our own heads when we're defining these things and when we're coding them, we don't necessarily think about what, what the problems are and how somebody can misuse it, right? I'm so, so 
driven to make, make this available for somebody to use it, that the challenge becomes how do I, how do I protect it, right? I, those are hard problems. Those are hard things to figure out. And so, I'm going to skip a couple slides here. I got the wave in the back that I'm, I'm rambling. If I can find my mouse, here we go. So when we start thinking about what's important, um, this is from uh, Postman. Again, anybody heard of Postman? Anybody use Postman? It's free, download it, it's fantastic, great tool. Um, but this is their state of, state of the API report. These are the things that people worry about. It's kind of intangible, isn't it? Like if I tell you that, you know, BOLA or, or IDOR, like, are, you know, those are problems, broken object level uh, uh, validation and, and, and access are broken. You don't necessarily know what that means. Threat modeling isn't easy. So it is a, it's an art form, it's a, it's a science all, all in one. So to translate these to what you have to worry about is a challenge. That's why we have smart people putting together the lists like this. So the Open Web Application Security Project, who I got called out last week because it's, no it's no longer the Open Web Application Security Project. One of the, it's either the W or the A changed like in the last month. One of them has changed, so I'm going to call it OWASP because I forget which it was. Um, they put these things together. They tell you the things that people are attacking. Um, but the second week of August now, um, CISA, which is the U.S. Um, uh, you know, uh, federal civilian uh, information security agency. Um, so I do a lot of work with CISA. I do a lot of work with DISA, um, the defense, uh, the, the, their defense counterpart. Um, they uh, announced as part of the Five Eyes thing, we're part of Five Eyes as well, um, with the Australian um, counterpart, that BOLA, or the, 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 the ability to access data that you shouldn't be able to access, right? So being able to tweak that. I love that example that Alyssa gave this morning. I'm going to use that for the rest of my life, of, be, of, of, of being able to have, have a car and say, I want, I want the Ferrari in front of me. Me, it would be like a, like a, like a Mercedes, you know, AMG or something like that. I'm a big Ferrari fan myself, but I'll, gi I'll give up my Hyundai for, for, for anything, right? Being able to say, okay, I'm going I'm I'm to I'm I'm take my ticket, change that 17 to an 18, um, and then pretend I'm that other person. That's what happens today. That's what happens in APIs, right? That's number one. Broken access control, broken object level authorization. Those are number one, whether you've got a web application or a mobile or, or, or an API. People play with that. I do. Whenever I see a cart and I see a cart ID that's predictable, what do I do? I start throwing numbers at it, see what happens. I scared myself when I bought something at somebody's website and I played with that and I got somebody else's cart and saw all the things that they bought and their home address. Luckily, I didn't see their credit card. And I wasn't even logged in, which is even worse than being logged in and being able to get those IDs. It's crazy, right? It happens. And this wasn't something that was written by some, you know, second-rate second person. This was an off-the-shelf cart application. I talked to the people. That's responsible disclosure. Unfortunately, responsible disclosure requires them to do something about it, which they didn't, but we won't go there. Um, so, these, the, so looking at these kind of things are very important. We've got to figure out what, how, how we can protect them and understand what the scale of our problem is. That's where we are today. Right? That's where that's where we got to figure out how we're going to go and 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 understand what we need to protect. So, who here has API applications today? API-based applications in your environment? Anybody? A few of you? Yeah. If you got a web application, I guarantee there's an API in there somewhere. It might be a microservice that something else is calling. Right? Microservice means that you're calling somebody else's problem. Right? And they've done all the threat modeling. They're completely safe. Right? <laughs> yeah, no. I will tell you in that pre-show application, I use struts because I wrote all my APIs in Java. That was 2009. I woke up 2016 to a nightmare. Thankfully, I was no longer responsible for that, but I was responsible for what 
10,000 websites around the world that had struts in them. Don't rely on anybody else to threat model your stuff. Threat model your own stuff. And so how, we can, how can we do that? We can start inventorying what we've got. So look at the application stack that you've got. Look at what's, how it's running. Look at the traffic that's flowing through it. Right? So if I, if, I, if I were going to put an F5 sales hat on, these are things that we can do. We can, we can look at your inbound traffic. We can look at the traffic as it flows through and build a taxonomy of what is going on inside of your application stack. And then we can start to look at where do you have problems? What URLs are you sending data through that aren't authenticated? Do you have a cart where I can just go grab that cart and I don't need a JOT token? Or even worse, you're using basic authentication and sending passwords back and forth across every API call? That's horrible, right? Nobody would ever do that. We do. We find these kind of things. And, and so we can help you start to figure out <coughs> what, what you need to worry about. This, this is an elephant-eating problem, right? Got, an, got a huge security problem in front of you. You got 20, 20 applications or 2,000 applications. I don't care how big your organization is. Your security problem is always going to be big. But if you can start to categorize it and understand what you can see, then you can start making some, some decisions of how we're, gonna, how we're gonna address it, right? Then we're gonna look at things like the OWASP top 10 model. Can we overlay our top 10 model and say, these ones are protected, these ones aren't protected. How are we gonna protect them, right? So all those things can, 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 can be brought in. Um, and you can start making some, some, some decisions on how you wanna protect it. How am I on time? Somebody was flashing me a card back there. Do I have another 10 minutes? Maybe? Okay. I go, I go till 22? So we got? Okay. I'm going to go till 22. How's that? So what I want to do now is share my screen. I promised you I was going to do a little bit. Actually, now I'm going to use mic stand. I'm going to feel trapped, but I will. So what I thought maybe I, I could do is um, fill a little bit of time here at the end and show you some of the things that I do when I'm, when I'm doing, can you, is, this, is the mic okay here? Are you here? Okay, good. Um, and when I'm looking at an application um, and, uh, trying to figure out what kind of traffic um, a customer's seeing or somebody's seeing. Um, could be on a... Uh, that's the one? Yep, that's the one. Um, I'd say, okay, so uh, I mentioned uh, OWASP, the letters that used to mean um, Open Web Application Security Project. Um, so they, they've put out a bunch of web applications that you can use to, to tinker around. Um, those are, you know, the, a lot of them are just available as a container, which is nice. You can just spin them up. So this is uh, something called Juice Shop. Uh, if you want to buy some juice, you can, you, can, uh, you, can, you can go ahead and, you know, use this as, a, as, as, a, um, as an example application. Um, but it, this one, the Juice Shop is interesting because it's API-based. And I can prove that it's API based because if I go in here and let's let me, who has ever used the dev tools inside of Chrome? Cool. All right. So if you didn't see what I did there, um, I am um, in, in Chrome and all I do is I right click on the page and say inspect. And you get a whole bunch of things that you can do. You can change the web page in, in, interactively. You can do a whole bunch of fun stuff. You have a console. You can execute JavaScript. A whole bunch of co cool things you can do inside of there. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm in the network tab. And so what we'll actually see is all the traffic that flows through my browser when I refresh the page. So you can see here all these, all, all these calls are happening in the page. So... To take it down just to the bare level, what happens is my page goes, my, my browser goes to a page, might be just a straight HTML page, could be a JavaScript page, or whatever it's going to be, but that page just gets pulled down, 
and inside of that page are a bunch of references to some scripts and stuff, and those can those get executed in real time, in, in, like interactively. So if I go to my cart, so let me see my, if I go here and I go to a cart, so if we scroll up here, right, we can see that there's been a bunch of, there's a bunch of gets, these are, you know, pull a bunch of stuff, there's some images that get pulled down, but if I go to my homepage here, just the, the site page, and I add something to the cart, um, you can see here that it's made a call to something called basket items and something called seven. Anybody know what seven is? In this case, it's an object that I'm referencing. Should I be referencing it as a seven? What I've been talking about, right? We don't necessarily want people to always know what seven is, right? We don't want to guess that. We probably should have some sort of better identifier, something that's long and guess unguessable, right? But I also have my own cart, right? So I define my own cart, and that again is probably an integer value in some of these unsecure applications. So if I guess your cart ID, I could go have a look at your cart, potentially, right? So those are things where we have the, that 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 it, those bola, you know, those those uh, object level references. I can get those and be able to pull those out. Right? That's me going back to my cart where I was buying the flight suit. Told you I was going to tell you I was a pilot, right? And, and I was referencing that identifier for the cart. Mine was like, I don't know, 64, 325 or something like that, right? I tried 64, 322. Oop, nothing. 21, oop, nothing, you know? And then I turned on uh, Burp Suite and said, go but generate a bunch of IDs. And it randomly grabbed a bunch of carts. And sure enough, I got address information for you know, a dozen people in a couple seconds, right? Doesn't sound like much. But that's a breach, right? Again, we shouldn't be letting people off. That's a breach, right? So this is, the, this is what happens inside the browser. So I can just go and look at the browser and figure out what's, what's going on. There's a whole bunch of things. It's hard to necessarily know when I click on this what's going to happen. But if I open this, the, these tools, I can get this information. The other cool thing is if I want to replay this, I can do things like this. I can go copy. So I can go as copy as curl. So told you I was, didn't want to stand still. So if you can see here, uh, I, I, I've right-clicked on, on the seven, and I've said copy, copy as curl. Anybody know what curl is? Command line URL t uh, tool. Um, if I wanted to go send this on the command line, um, I, can, I can send that command in, right? And it's, it's exactly as the browser does it. It doesn't know that it's curl. There's no way for it to know that. Is there any possible way that I could ever know that somebody's using curl and not using my browser? I could challenge it. I could send a response back saying, hey, what's one plus one, right? Curl won't be able to respond that. Maybe the browser can do that, right? So we can start to, we start to, we start to figure these things out. But if I grab this and I say copy as curl, I'll tell you, show you a really cool thing. I can go in here and let's just say, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna say new request. Anybody see new request? There we go. Why am I not seeing new request? There, there we go, add request. Of course, my filter was too tight. There we go. So if I, re, if I, if I paste this, <sighs> that's now taken my curl request and put it into, into uh, Postman as a full request. It's grabbed all my headers, Right? So if I go look here, there's 21 headers that just pulled in. Right? All kinds of things. It's got the refer. It's got all the things in here. Right? It's just mimicked that whole request. So now I can just go and start playing with this. Right? I can look at the, at, at, at the body. This happens to be you know, just a, a get request. But if this was a post and there was a bunch of things, I could start playing with that. But what happens if I tried to go six and sent that? Look at that. Success. What did I just prove? Basic object level re 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 requests, right? I, I, I'm pulling this information out. Now, there happens to be nothing in that cart. What happens if I try five, right? Oh, look at that. There's cart, cart information. Now, is this my cart? Probably not. Go do this in your web application. <laughs> 
Um, these are things where you can just you can easily start to find how it how easy it is to to start poking around and finding finding access to your, to, to your to your different applications. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up here <coughs> with a very scary story, which has a Canadian uh, twist on it. So I'm a member of um, something called the FDX. So it's the Financial Data Exchange. Um, so it's a it's something called open banking, um, and so. Canada, we're actually defined. We're, we are we are following um, open banking, and we are implementing open banking, um, which means that um, if you happen to use something like uh, Mint from Intuit or something like that, um, it's a way for you to ha use one system and, and sort of scrape a whole bunch of data and be able to you know go to one place and, and pay your bills. Maybe from maybe you got a Scotia Bank account and an RBC account and a credit card from Amex or something like that. And you want to see everything in one spot. What they used to do is they actually used to log in as you and scrape that page. So they would log in, have the page, and pull it up and everything like that. There was no tracking that it was mint. They would look at the credit card, the, the, the IP address, and they would, they, you know, Amex would say, wait, stop that. You know, you're scraping my page. You're doing it 100,000 times a day, right? Really not a great way of, of doing business. So FDX is something called, is, is, is an API standard that we're defining to how we're going to share data between these different banks, right? So the U.S., very just uh, their 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 disaggregated environment. Um, do, it doesn't lend itself well to this. But the banks themselves are all in this. So I go to the, con the conference next week. Every major bank in Americas is 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 there. In this in in uh, in, um, in Europe, there's actually the open banking standard, which is very similar to FDX, but it's it's just a different format. But now we're sharing how we're going to communicate and, and send data back and forth. So at last year's conference, one of the pen testers got up and talked about a pen test he did, and and so they um, they had a bank, um, and this is real. I, I'm not making this up, and I'm not I'm, I'm trying not to paraphrase anything that the, the, that uh, that uh, Cliff said. Um, but the bank had an application from years ago when they had mobile banking or web-based banking, you know, 20 years ago, they had a uh, foreign transaction uh, uh, thing on their website. And they said, you can only use it five times a day. And every time you type in a, a value, you had to have two decimal places. And so that, you know, that you could go there and you could go and say, I want to transfer, you know, US dollars to Canadian dollars or whatever, right? Um, but then, like Peloton, they went through a digital transformation weren't those great words? I hated. I'm glad we don't use digital transformation anymore. That's so 2020. Um, but they went through this and they said, "Okay, we're going to we're going to develop all this and we're going to use APIs and it's going to be great because we're going to now put it in our mobile application and we're going to make everything fantastic and everyone's going to be able to use this." <coughs> so this pen tester took the application and said, ah, "Cool." Started looking at it. What's the first thing it did? Right clicked in Chrome and said. What's going on behind the scenes? They realized that the transaction um, was just making a bunch of calls. And the web application, the JavaScript, the web application was saying, oh, you've done this five times, please stop. And it also said, oh, only two decimal places. So the, the, the value checking was actually in the control to, to find out how many decimal places you were doing. So what they did is they looked at what is the biggest difference in the transactions, and it turned out it was British pounds to Canadian dollars. Told you there was Canadian tie-in. And he told me it wasn't a Canadian bank. I, 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 I hope so. Um, and then they ran it. Three lines of Python code with 17 decimal places. So we get rounding errors. And not five times a day, not five times a second, but about 100 maybe a 1,000 times a second, completely fine. They transferred 10,000 Canadian dollars into British pounds, um, then looked at that, and that was actually, it wasn't a lot more, you know, maybe, maybe a few more dollars, maybe. They never actually told me the, 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 the number, but maybe it was an extra 10 or $20, and kept doing that, like 50, 60, 70,000 times, just like hammering the site. And then it stopped, and he's like, oh, the bank caught me. All the business logic was in their was in their application, not in the not in the API. There was no checks in the back end. But they thought, oh, they must have seen that somebody was hitting my the back end, and that's why they stopped me. So we called the bank up and said, responsible disclosure. 
I found a vulnerability in your in your uh, in your FTX application, um, and they said, "Oh, thanks." And you said, uh, "You didn't know?" They said, "No, but thanks for telling us." They said, "Well, we just transferred the equivalent of about fifty thousand pounds into Canadian dollars and back," and they're like, "Oh." <laughs> Thanks. Then we need to go put another fifty thousand pounds in that bank account. That was their contr their, their compensating control. That they they that they lo would lose fifty thousand pounds, you know, or whatever the equivalent of that money was in the transfer, and that's the only thing that stopped them. So when you start refactoring and go through digital transformation and adopt APIs, adopt APIs. They are phenomenal. They're going to make your life so much easier. But control your business logic and understand what's supposed to be going through. Anybody can think of an idea, some of the things that might have been able to protect that? Maybe stopping them from doing it 10,000 times a second or a minute, whatever it was, right? Rate limiting, right? So being able to rate limit by, by user. An IP is perfect, right? Nobody ever shares IPs and everybody's IP is exactly what they really are, right? No. That was in Ottawa last week. That is not what's going on in Ottawa right now. IPs aren't what you want. You want to be able to look at the person who's logged in. So only force, only allow people to, who are logged in and properly authorized and authenticated, and then let them do it 50 times a day because you know who they are and track them, right? And what about that 17 decimal place thing? Well, had they done an API discovery and looked at the API traffic, they would have realized that most of the traffic only has two decimal places. So they could have built a rule to say, hey, if this is more than three decimal places, let's raise our hand. Let's have a look at this. So by being able to put just a couple little controls in there, they could have easily protected themselves. So, but if you don't know what you don't know, how are you going to protect yourself? You're going to have to figure things out, look at your application stack, pick up the phone and talk to a developer. We're nice. We lie. But we, we try to do it all for good, right? So I think I'm way over my time, and I really, I really appreciate your time. Um, any questions? I'll be around. But yes, yes, right? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. So, so, so you mentioned the API call there, and you said the validation logic was in the app. So are you advocating you put it in the API as well, like double. Um, so you could you could put it in the API, or you could put it at a, at a place where there's there's a trap there's a place where you can control it, right? So if there's a in, in the example like if if I'm going to put my F5 hat on it, it's going to be at the proxy level, being able to understand what that kind of traffic looks like, authenticating that JOT against and understanding the JOT token. Sorry if I haven't explained it. Is is OAuth's way of identifying a user? It's a it's a base64 encoded ID, right? So I'm going to know that you're you. Um, and I'm going to know that at, at a point where I can control it. So if I give you downstream control to make a change, someone's going to make that change, right? So okay. wherever you can control it, put your hands around it, that's the safe place to do it. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions? Yep. So the question was... Um, Websites that are developed with like uh, common frameworks, uh, WordPress, and uh, it's, it's mentioned another one, but yeah. So there could be like React and stuff like that. So a lot of those are are user interface frameworks, right? So React is a user interface framework that gives you a lot of capabilities to to do input validation. But again, you're doing input validation um, at a point where somebody else can control the behind the scenes, right? So you still want to have it at your uh, at your service level or your microservice level or in front of uh, in front of it again where you can control it that's the place to have it it doesn't stop you from ever stop you that that's the perfect point why i have the api top 10 and the application top 10 equally on the same slide because you have to worry about the the application and the apis equally important but the the requirements are a little different right so you still want to do input validation on your application because that's still going to make sure that things are coming in properly. But if I only do that at the application layer and let somebody else just say, do a call with the, with the, uh, with the API, they're going to misuse it like this person did with this, with this attack on, on, on the FTX transactions. Does that help answer the question? Yeah. Um, again, standing on the shoulders of greatness is, is a myth. 
Um, like I said, I, I used uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Jakarta uh, Apache Tomcat um, and, and the, the struts library and everything like that because I didn't want to build a file upload process. But that's why CRA was down for a week because the file upload thing was, was found eight years later to be vulnerable. Right? So you have to understand that just because your application passes pen test today doesn't mean it's going to pass a pen test or a validation in six months or a year or five years. Right? You have to, that's a continuous check, always validating. Right? Great points. Thank you. Good? Awesome. Thanks very much, folks. <laughs>